everybody. Oh, Fabio, are you recording? Thank you. I yes. Know, yes. Good. Very important because I know that Chester can't make it for the first few weeks at this time slot. Um, <clears throat> so he's got a good excuse for not being here. Um, and the purpose is for me to present some of the projects that are ongoing in the Ted Cog lab group. And so for those of you who've been in the group for a while, there won't be terribly much new, except that not everybody is working on all the projects. So in fact, there may be some uh, potentially interesting information for you as well. And I'll try to keep my remarks reasonably short. And with a bit of luck, you should now see my slides, do you? Okay, very good. Um, right, so um, this is a summary of the projects that are ongoing in the uh, Ted Carr group. The global context for all of our work is the concerning fact that democracy is uh, in retreat uh, around the world. Now, I'm saying this not just because I think it is, but because there's a lot of data to suggest that. There's a number of institutes and uh, think tanks and journals and universities around the world that are measuring the state of democracy. And uh, when they do that, then during the last 10 to 20 years, there's been a significant decline now, this graph here is from one of these institutions. It was published last year, and it's a decadal trend. And the way to read this graph is by considering any point below the diagonal as having declined in terms of liberal democracy. And so if you have a look around, then I don't know if you can see my highlighted cursor, but for example, the US is below the diagonal. Uh, Czech Republic, Greece, you know, a lot of EU member states, uh, Poland, you know, the bottom has fallen out during the last 10 years. Uh, so these are uh, uh, concerning uh, trends. There are also some, like Armenia is doing better now than it did 10 years ago. It, it's, it's not all bad, but it is bad, uh, in particular, if you look at the type of country involved, which are like the US, you know, supposed to be highly democratic and, um, you know, to some extent they still are in the sense that the US is still pretty high up uh, compared to, you know, Malawi or something, but it is now below South Korea. <laughs> so that's, you know, somewhat uh, concerning. Now that's the background. And the reason this has given rise to Ted Cog, Technology, Democracy and Cognition, is because based on some recent analysis by myself and collaborators, we've identified a number of sort of cognitive pressure points between you know, how people think and how online information architectures are designed that have adverse consequences or potentially adverse consequences for democracy. So, this is our sort of meta theoretical framework. This is <clears throat> the, the sort of at the top level, when you look at the online architecture, you look at human cognition, you consider democracy, you know, there are these four uh, pressure points. Now, I don't have time to go through them all in great detail or or you know, explain them all. <laughs> Instead, what I'll do is I'll pick the projects that we're pursuing within the group. And I will, excuse me. And I will sort of show how they relate to these pressure points. So here are the projects that are currently um, in the lab, in the group, in one way or another. The two at the bottom are smallish, <laughs> and I won't talk about them. 
the four above the dashed lines, Jigsaw, the Volkswagen Foundation, the ERC, and Jitsuvax, they're the ones <laughs> that are active, that are large, and that I'll now take some time to present to you together with some you know, interesting snippets of results, hopefully interesting snippets. So this is the uh, team, the Jitsuvax team. <coughs> huh. These are the team members other than myself. I don't put my own name down all the time. I mean, sort of implied that I'm part of this as well. Uh, those are my collaborators. And the basic approach that is being funded by Jigsaw, which, by the way, if you don't know it, oh, excuse me. Jigsaw is a technology incubator that is part of Google. So when I say Jigsaw, I'm talking about money that ultimately uh, comes from Google because Jigsaw isn't selling anything. They don't make any money. They just do research for Google. And they have a very uh, interesting semi-independent relationship from Google. But we're talking about uh, Google money. And the bottom line underlying this project is the idea of inoculation, which a lot of you already know about. Some of all of you will have heard of it. And it basically is a psychological tool that has two elements. One is an explicit warning of an impending threat. In other words, you got to tell people that they might be misled. That warning itself is an important component. And then uh, there is a refutation of an anticipated argument that might be used to mislead people. Now, this requires knowledge ahead of time of how people might be misinformed because you've got to defang that misleading argumentation. But importantly, it doesn't require advanced knowledge of how people might be misinformed. And that, I think, is very important because it means we don't have to be specific in our inoculation. Instead, we can be generic in how we inoculate people. Let me illustrate this by reporting a recent uh, study that we published in Science Advances last year, where we presented people with brief videos that informed them about how they might be misled. And following that, they were presented with social media posts, synthetic, you know, generated by us, that either did or did not use these techniques. And we added, asked people a variety of questions about each of the stimuli to see how they would respond to that. So it's a very simple type of design. <laughs> you sample a lot of people, in our case, about a thousand in each study. We randomly assigned them, <laughs> oh, excuse me, to an inoculation group where they get this educational video or a control group where they don't get a video uh, of, that's relevant, but instead some, you know, something about freezer burn or Bitcoin or huh, something unrelated. And after they see the video, they're given these social media posts. Oh, excuse me. And they have to decide whether or not they're being misled. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play you one of those videos, and I'm hoping you can hear it. Uh, so uh, let me know if you can. Give me a thumbs down if you can't hear it, and I'll have to reshare my screen with the speaker on. You might think I'm skipping this out. Don't. What happens next to make you tear up? 
Wait, you're still here? <laughs> I mean, great. She looks like the trick works. You see, when watching videos or browsing online, you're likely to encounter content that is loaded with emotional language. And with good reason, playing into emotions, especially negative ones such as fear, anger, or contempt, is a trick to get you to pay attention to something when you otherwise wouldn't. It's likely that is a big part of the reason you're still watching this ad is because you were lured in by our use of emotional language in the very first sentence. Research has shown expressing emotion is key for the spread of moral and especially political ideas in social networks. So let's say when you're writing a headline and you're trying your hardest to manipulate your readers to click, one thing you can do is pepper your headline with a bunch of emotionally charged words. Call it a horrific accident instead of a serious one, a disgusting ruling instead of a disagreeable one, or a heartbreaking twist of faith instead of an unfortunate coincidence. That way, you're likely to reach more people and influence their reactions. So let's see how this plays out in real life. Let's take the following headline from the movie Angry Book. No emotional manipulation of play, just to the point, no nonsense coverage of such an important event in world history. This headline on the other hand, see what they did there? The writer used an emotionally charged word like revolting to describe a whole group of people. I mean, these people, oh well, you get the point. They're fear-mongering. So whenever you feel outraged or angry, remember, someone may be pulling the strings. Don't be manipulated. True flowers, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Right, I hope you could hear that. Uh, so that's the type of video we have. Oh, you might think of And we have um, a whole bunch of them by now. Um, and then afterwards, <clears throat> people are exposed to these simulated social media posts and they give us a rating on how much they find this post to be manipulative. Now, some of them are manipulative. Uh, others are not, and people have to tell the difference between that. Um, they provide their confidence in making the judgment about that. They provide us with a trustworthiness rating of these tweets, and they indicate whether or not they would share um, the tweet with others. And across five experiments that targeted... Huh, Five different manipulation techniques. The one you just saw was emotional language. Uh, the video you just saw was inoculating against that. And the other four were incoherence, false dichotomy, scapegoating, ad hominem arguments. You know, all the videos are available if you're interested. And across all the videos, what we find is that inoculation is effective. And that's what the data show. Now, the way to read the data is by looking at the red dots, um, which refer to what we call discernment. Discernment is telling the difference between detecting something that is manipulative and something that isn't. So it's a different score between the two. And anything to the right of the vertical dashed line means that there was a significant effect of the inoculation onto um, discernment. The left panel is about technique recognition and the panel on the right is about trustworthiness. And in both cases, the other measures give you the same results. In all cases, basically, we find that the inoculation is boosting uh, performance or discernment. Now, this isn't just a laboratory phenomenon. In the paper I alluded to earlier, we have another experiment, the sixth experiment that was done on YouTube, in, in the real life on YouTube, where we had 25,000 participants and we found exactly the same thing. And since then, Google has rolled out these uh, campaigns uh, in Eastern Europe. They were... <laughs> Huh. Uh, running a campaign on Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok in some Eastern European countries. 38 million views of inoculation videos overall, so it's a pretty massive uh, experiment. And they found increased discernment of disinformation after people were inoculated against misinformation about uh, Ukrainian refugees. 
And at the moment, as we speak, a similar campaign is being unrolled in India. Uh, I'm not part of that, but John Rosenbeck from Cambridge is one of the people who's part of this group. And they're going to use like an Indian sized sample. So, you know, it's probably, you know, 100 million people or something. India has a lot of people on the internet. So there's a lot of stuff that can be done. And that is all uh, quite promising. And we're now uh, adding, combining it with other interventions. There's a paper with Gordon Pennycook as first author that is currently under review. Uh, maybe I'll have some news on that later. And the whole idea of inoculation is permeating a lot of things we do in the Ted Carr group, including Kia, uh, Kia's PhD. Uh, she's not here today, but she's one of the PhD students associated with ProDem Info. So that was uh, Jigsaw, the basic inoculation idea. Uh, by the way, if you have any questions, just raise your hand or or start speaking. I can't see everybody, but I'm happy to uh, take questions for clarification if uh, if that's necessary. If not, then let me move on to the next um, project, which is funded by the Volkswagen Foundation in Germany, which incidentally has nothing to do with Volkswagen. It was established in the 1950s by Volkswagen, but it is actually a state-run uh, funding uh, body that, that has no affiliation with Volkswagen or hasn't had it for 70 years uh, at all. The team is rather large because the project is split over three nodes. Huh. One of them being Bristol. <clears throat> the other two being the Max Planck Institute in Berlin and Northeastern University. And again, it's a large team, including also our former colleague here in Bristol, Almog Simshan, who about a week ago moved back to Israel, but is continuing to be involved. And the name of this project is reclaiming individual autonomy and democratic discourse online. And unlike the jigsaw stuff, this focuses much more on the involvement of machines in human cognition. By machines, I mean uh, the internet or social media. And in particular, I want to present you with one example that revolves around algorithmic content curation. Now, whenever you use the internet, basically, anything you look at will have been curated by an algorithm. Um, if you search anything on Google, an algorithm is rank ordering the search results. Uh, if you look at Facebook, the rank ordering of information will be done by an algorithm. On Twitter, same thing. Responses to a tweet will be rank ordered by an algorithm. And the list goes on and on and on. And the assumption here or the intention is to satisfy your preferences so that you stay on the platform longer. That's really all it is about. You know, algorithms for Facebook are there to keep you engaged because if you get bored, then you walk away. And that's the worst thing you can do for Facebook because then they can't show you any ads. So the algorithms are supposed to make you happy. They <clears throat> do that demonstrably. There's a recent paper that showed that, that if you turn off the Facebook algorithm and you go to a chronological feed, um, user dwell time is dramatically reduced. And so <laughs> these are very important tools for the platforms. And there are different estimates here, but apparently up to 70% of anything that's being watched on YouTube uh, results from the recommender system, the autoplay feature that just plays the next video, whether you like it or not. 70% uh, of all the videos watched are driven by the algorithm, not a person actually clicking saying, yes, I want to watch this particular video. Now, there's nothing bad inherently about algorithms. 
you wouldn't find anything online if you didn't have algorithms. Um, and, you know, why shouldn't an algorithm withhold things from you that you don't like and show you things that you like uh, instead? Well, that's fine up to a point, but if it somehow goes too far, then uh, maybe we have a problem. And the question is, what is too far? Now, to illustrate this question, I want to tell you about a recent study, several studies we've done for the Volkswagen project that depart from this study that's now, you know, eight years old, which show that if you know 300 Facebook likes of a person, then you can build or exploit an existing machine language model that predicts that person's personality with greater accuracy than their own spouse. Now, 300 likes is a lot, but you don't need 300 to do better than a work colleague, for example. In fact, all you need is 10 likes and you will do better than a work colleague. And with 60 or 70, you're going to do as well as somebody's friend. So it is extremely powerful, the information that you leave behind uh, on Facebook. And that has implications for democracy or can have implications. It's a little hard to tell. And that is because if, if, you, if you have access to this knowledge about personality, then you can potentially customize messages to manipulate a single person online. Political messages that you can send to specific individuals or at least you know, highly selected groups of people online to make them maximally persuasive. And the concern here is that that is eroding this free marketplace of idea of ideas, uh, you know, there's no rebuttal that is possible by opponents if they don't even know what the messages are that are being shown on Facebook. You know, how would you rebut something you don't know about? And the whole thing just becomes very furtive and very manipulative and uh, concerning. Now, it has been shown repeatedly now, by now I think I'm pretty confident to, to be able to conclude that this so-called micro-targeted advertising where you select people based on their characteristics is effective and is more effective than just randomly blasting out uh, commercial messages. If you're interested in this, um, one starting point for this whole issue of algorithms and so on is this report that I was lead author on together with a large team of others for the European Commission a few years ago. It's aged reasonably well, uh, even three years later, which in this field is amazing because usually everything changes every six months. But we, we managed to get it right. And even three years later, I'm still prepared to put my name to it uh, rather than run away for cover because it was all wrong. Um, so... How then might we respond to micro-targeting? Well, we have looked at two different aspects of that. The first one is detection. And the second one is to reverse engineer micro-targeting and its effectiveness, provided we can detect it. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. Here's the detection part. It's a paper that Almog was lead author on that just came out earlier this year. Uh, in fact, only about three or four months ago. And what we do, what we did in this paper was to create a machine learning model that allows us to identify um, what people of certain personality types like to read. Now, we did this by, you know, going to a uh, online group of users that are interested in fiction and that are both writing and consuming fiction on Reddit. We got about a thousand people to uh, participate in the study. They volunteered to give us their personality. So we were able to score that. And we then 
looked at what they like to read. And we formulated this machine learning model that allowed us to uh, describe this association, which in turn now allows us to look at text, any text, and tell us which text appeals to people of different personality types. So, for example, here are two uh, ads that we harvested off Facebook. They're both uh, British. They both actually ran on Facebook. These are real ads. Uh, they are not all political, but they're sort of including, you know, government messages. This is back to the uh, pandemic when there were travel restrictions, the ad on the left. And what I'm showing you here is the ad on the left that the machine learning algorithm said, hey, this will appeal people who are low on openness. Openness is a personality dimension. People can be high on openness or low. And the one, the, the ad here on the left, according to the algorithm, was um, low on openness. The one on the high was appealing to people high on openness, you know, check out Dr. So-and-so's visually stunning digital exhibition, exploring the concept of well-being, that data and its power and potential. You know, that is text that people high on openness appreciate. The one on the left is appreciated by people low on openness. Now, how do we know whether this actually makes a difference to persuasiveness? Well, we ran a whole bunch of studies. And the general approach is as follows. We basically have two measures. On the y-axis, uh, I don't know if you can see the moving. <laughs> nah, it's not working too. Yeah, no, kind of. No, it won't move. The, the cursor here, up and down, that is the openness that we infer from the text of the ad through the machine learning algorithm. And then for each person in our experiments, we also have the actual participants, actual openness from their personality score, right? And so we can now look at uh, the difference, those are the red arrows, uh, between a person's openness um, and the openness that the ad is presumably effective for, okay? So the machine tells us how open the ad is, quote, unquote, and the person, we know their openness score, and we can now plot each ad uh, in the space of ad openness, person openness. And the closer those two measures are to being the same, that is the closer they are to this diagonal line, um, the more um, matched the person is to that ad or vice versa, and the more persuasive it should be. Okay, make sense? So we're trying to predict openness of the person who likes it from the machine language, machine learning algorithm, and we get people's actual openness, and if they coincide, then we have that perfect ad for you. Question is, is it more persuasive? And the answer is uh, yes, and we have three studies to show that. Um, and what we have um, in, in the second two studies is a particular twist, because instead of taking Facebook ads, we generated uh, politically relevant materials such as uh, sound here. Vaccines should be available to everyone everywhere. Tell Boris Johnson to take action. This was done at a time when Johnson was still prime minister. And then we asked chat GPT, oops, to rewrite this either for people high in openness or low in openness. And of course we tell GPT what we mean by openness. And this is what you get. You get a uh, high openness text that GPT thinks should appeal to people high on openness, and you get low openness that GPT thinks should appeal to people low on openness. And when you read this stuff, well, maybe you get the sense of a difference there that might appeal 
to people high and low in openness. When we validate these ads, then we find that, yes, indeed, human judges, as well as our machine learning algorithm, agree when something is high or low in openness. And we get the same pattern of results three times over. And the pattern of results is that the greater the mismatch between the ad and the person's personality, the lower the judge persuasiveness. In other words, matching a personality implied by the ad to the person's actual personality is enhancing persuasiveness. The, the line here is sloped negatively. It looks small and it's a small effect, but statistically, uh, it is it is uh, highly significant, and we show it three times over. So I'm pretty confident that this effect is real. So um, we can detect micro-targeting. We can show it's effective. We can manipulate messages using chat GPT and make them more or less effective for different people. So what's next? The next step... Um, is to use this and flip it around what we call reverse engineering by telling people when they're being confronted with content that is too good to be true. So if you're high on openness and you get an ad that is high on openness, then we would flag that. And we would say, whoa, 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 this ad seems to us might have been written for you because it matches your personality extremely well. Um, does that then reduce the persuasiveness of the targeted content? That is the open question. And those are two experiments that Fabio will be running uh, this year, during the academic year, to get an answer to that, that question. And the long-term goal is maybe to develop a plugin in a browser that tells people whenever they're reading something that is just, you know, very much like themselves to be careful because they might be more convinced than they want to be if the, if it weren't such a good match. That's, that's sort of the long-term goal. All right, again, questions anytime. If there are no questions, I'm now segueing into the next project, but again, um, do interrupt if anything is, is not clear or you want to know more about it. Um, <clears throat> the third project I want to talk about is ProDem Info, protecting the democratic information space. The team here is again involving some familiar names. Um, and, and myself, of course, Richard Westaway is the project manager at Bristol here for that project. And the basic conundrum that Program Info is trying to resolve is this. Uh, on the one hand, Donald Trump and other populist politicians like him make false or misleading claims every five minutes. Okay, in Donald Trump's case, it was once an hour, 24-7 throughout his presidency. But, you know, all, all the time, they're, they're just producing stuff that is false misleading or completely invented. Well, that's sort of problematic in itself. <laughs> but what I find even more problematic is that in the case of Donald Trump, throughout his presidency, most Republican voters considered him to be honest. About three quarters, give or take a few. So, and that to me is a basic conundrum. How can a serial liar which is what he is. <laughs> How can he be considered honest? What's going on here? How is that possible? And the answer we think, maybe, is in the realization that there are different subjective conceptions of truth. That is, um, that when we talk about truth or honesty, that isn't just one thing. Um, it is, in fact, 
a multidimensional construct. And I want to focus here on two aspects of honesty. One that we call belief speaking and one that we can call fact speaking. And they are sort of end points on a, on a continuum. And basically, belief speaking is something that refers only to the sincerity with which people express their beliefs. So a belief speaking approach to honesty is not concerned with facts. It is not concerned with veracity. It is not concerned with the world. In fact, it is only concerned with whether the, pe the person honestly reports their feeling. And here are some quotes that illustrate by certain po uh, uh, politicians and by others in this sort of populist sphere of politics that illustrate what, what I mean by that. If you say things like, oh yeah, well, fact, that's antiquated. Truth isn't truth. One man's fact is another man's lie. You know, if you're sort of denying the idea that anything you say has to have a connection to reality, that is an extreme form <laughs> of belief speaking. And that is problematic, I find, because democracy relies on a shared body of knowledge. Uh, you can't disagree about, you know, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq unless you at least acknowledge the existence of Iraq. But if you say, oh, no, 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 <laughs> there is no such thing as Iraq, well, then you can't have a meaningful debate about how to deal with that, with that issue. So uh, that is uh, the basic problem or the basic issue that we're trying to get at, this conception of truth that is entirely subjective and recognizes only how sincere somebody is in expressing their belief. That belief speaking and how that differs from fact speaking or from an acknowledgement of reality when you consider honesty, that is what we have been looking at within ProDem Info. And here is a paper that I want to tell you about briefly that came out on Monday, as it turns out, this week, where we looked at the tweets of all members of the U.S. Congress for about 10 or 11 years, 1.6 million tweets. And what we did, and I'll explain this in a moment, what we did was to identify the extent to which each of the tweets either embodied fact speaking or belief speaking. And we then looked at the accuracy of the information being shared in that tweet. So we have an indication of the rhetoric in the tweet and the reliability or accuracy of the information being shared. So. How do we identify belief speaking and fact speaking? Well, this tells you how we did it. We created some dictionaries. We generated the initial candidate set based on our analysis, our own subjective analysis of these two conceptions of honesty. And we thought, well, if people want to be honest because they talk about facts, then they use words like reality, examine, evidence, fact, proof, and so on. If people think they're honest because they're sincerely expressing their beliefs, then they're not going to talk about evidence, but they'll talk about belief, opinion, feel, common sense. You know, they'll invoke the common sense of the people. They will talk about anything but evidence and only about their own feelings. Now, we validated those dictionaries. I don't have time to tell you exactly how, but we're pretty, pretty sure that these dictionaries are tapping what we want them to tap. And just to illustrate the result, I'm going to show you four out of these 1.6 million tweets by members of Congress that we Analyzed. So we have two by Republicans on the left, two by Democrats on the right. The one on top, the ones on top, express a lot of belief speaking, according to our approach. The one at the bottom express a lot of uh, 
fact speaking, according to our approach. So, for example, top left, Schiff, he's a congressperson, definitely doesn't have an ironclad impeachment case. He surely has himself, though, an active ironclad imagination and a boatload of bad intentions. Okay, that's that's belief speaking. At the bottom, you know, we need to know how this pandemic started. <clears throat> well, I encourage whistleblowers uh, who can inform a complete scientific and objective investigation into the origins of COVID-19 to contact us. So, that is, no matter what the intention might be, that is the language, the fact speaking, and the two on the right you can read by yourself. So I think that shows to me fairly, you know, nicely how these dictionaries can identify different types of speech. And if we now relate the content of the tweets to the accuracy of the information shared in the tweets, we get the following pattern. Let's first look at the panel on the right. The right deals with fact speaking. So the more a tweet expresses fact speaking, the more accurate the content. That is what the graph means because the y-axis is plotting accuracy using a certain proxy measure I don't have time to explain. The higher you are, the more accurate you are. And the further to the right you are on the fact speaking panel, the more you engage in fact speaking. And what you can see is that for both parties, the more fact speaking language you use, the more likely you are to share information about higher quality. And that's true for both parties, blue or Democrats, red or uh, Republican uh, members of Congress. Now look on the left for belief speaking. Now, again, the higher you are, the more accurate that you are. Um, but now the further on the right you are within this panel, the more you express belief speaking, this intuition-based, sincerity-based conception of honesty. And what you find there is that for Republicans, at least, not for Democrats, but for Republicans, there's the striking decline in quality the more belief speaking you express. So it appears that um, for Republicans in the United States Congress, increasing belief speaking is a gateway to sharing of misinformation for them. And that is interesting because what that does is to open the, an avenue to the following examinations, uh, namely whether people consider politicians to be honest when they're explicitly asked to take this belief speaking perspective, as opposed to when they're asked to take a fat speaking uh, perspective. And we've done a few experiments on that. And I think the initial data are kind of promising. We're continuing this. Fabio is also involved in that. And um, yes, watch this space. Luke, you had a question. Hello. Yes, sorry, I've, I've got a cold. So if you can't hear, I do apologize. Um, does this change in accuracy across fact speaking and belief speaking happen across other political dichotomies rather than just Republican and Democrats? Because that's obviously specific to the US. Ah, very interesting question. Um, we haven't done it elsewhere. We've only done it in the US so far. Mm. But we have tweets from all UK MPs uh, for the same time period. We've downloaded them. We have access to them. Um, so we can do the same analysis for the UK. And in fact, I was in Brussels yesterday and presented this to the, to the European Commission. And I got an email this morning from somebody in the audience who's British at Sheffield, and she has all the tweets as well and is very keen to work with us to analyze that. So I don't have an answer yet, but uh, that's a very good question and we're working on it. Well, thank you.
Any other questions? Uh, yes, Steve, we have a question from Alan, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, just a, a quick question um, on the belief speaking option. Uh, if, that, if that included tweets that tended to be phrased in ways like, in my opinion, or I believe that, how, how would you be able to test accuracy for that? Or, or was it limited to tweets that shared some other, a link to some other source of information? Yes. And, and, and then that was what was tested for accuracy. Precisely. You're exactly right. We are looked at tweets for this that had a link. <clears throat> right. And we could look at the link, at the domain in the link, and there is a a way in which you can assess the quality based on something called NewsGuard, which is a very sophisticated professional database developed by journalists and others who go through each domain and apply um, fairly well-established quote unquote objective criteria to establish the reliability of a domain. So we don't look at the link to see if each article is true or false. We just say, hey, that's an untrustworthy domain or yes, that's a trustworthy domain. Okay. So the accuracy is external to the tweets. The accuracy is the domain to which they link. Does that answer your question? It does, yes. Okay, cool. Right, then moving on, last but not least, to a uh, very large uh, project involving some familiar names, but also a lot of new ones. The lab manager for this one here at Bristol is Ginny Gold, and Dawn, who's also present, is the lead uh, researcher on this at the Bristol node. Jitsu Max is... Um, an EU-funded project that deals with vaccination. Um, it's called Jitsumax because instead of <laughs> combating people's attitudes and their mistaken beliefs about vaccinations directly, what we do is we, we empathize with their uh, underlying attitudes, and we use that empathy uh, that playing with their underlying attitude as a tool to then refute the misinformation. So it is still about refuting misinformation when necessary. It is about inoculation against misinformation, same as all the other stuff we do. But this project is all about customizing conversation with patients who are vaccine hesitant based on their underlying what we call attitude roots. Now, I don't have time to explain this in great detail, but just to give you one example, if somebody walks in the door and says, oh, well, I'm not going to take a vaccine because, you know, that's only that only exists to make profits for the pharmaceutical industry. Well, then you have a fairly good idea that this person might believe in all sorts of conspiracies involving the pharmaceutical industry. By contrast, if somebody drifts in the door and says, oh, I don't want the vaccine because I'm terrified of needles. Well, that's a very different reason for not getting vaccinated. That has nothing to do with the pharma industry. And then it would be kind of silly to, to tell this person, don't worry, the pharmaceutical industry is looking after you. Yeah. That's not the issue. The issue is fear. You have to address that differently. And so the idea is that uh, we offer tailored refutations. Up until now, the main deliverable of this project, one of many, has been this new technique of um, talking to patients that we call the empathetic refutational interview, or ERI. And the idea is that instead of just providing facts about how safe and effective vaccines are, you, you engage in this other process. And the other process is to first elicit the person's concern. That allows you to identify why they're vaccine hesitant. Once you know that, you can affirm that the reasons for why they might be concerned. If somebody is afraid of needles, you can't just say, ha-ha. You have to say, oh, well, you know, gee, 
that's too bad, or I understand. Let's work with that fear. And then you offer something that is tailored to the person to then move forward towards uh, vaccination. Now, we've done a lot of experiments. Uh, Dawn has led a lot of experiments that, that implement this empathetic refutation. Um, here is just a float chart of a representative experiment in this context where we always have an experimental condition that is testing an aspect of this ERI, this refutational interview, against the control where the doctor is just providing, you know, just says vaccines are good for you. And in a nutshell, more or less, these experimental tests were successful. Not every single one, not under all conditions, but the overall overarching pattern was one of success. So we're now at the stage where we have enough empirical support for this refutational interview to roll it out um, and, and to train healthcare professionals in the UK and elsewhere in its use. In fact, for the next 10 days or so, Dawn and also myself on occasion are involved in training healthcare professionals around the country in uh, how to administer this ERI and also how to train others in administering it. And one aspect of this effort is this um, database of anti-vaccination arguments that uh, we have produced and that's now available in God knows how many languages, uh, four or five or something. We just added Romanian, but we have five others or something, right? Uh, Actually, how many languages? German, German, French, Spanish, English, and Romanian. Five. Very five. good. Yeah. Okay. There you are. <laughs> so um, if you're interested, you can have a look at that. Yeah, and this is what's ongoing uh, in, in the Jitsu Vax project right now. Um, and I think, yes, that brings me to the end, my summary of the stuff that's hip and happening in the lab. And um, yes, any, I forgot to mention that Angelo is leading this in Portugal. Actually, you're leading it in Romania soon. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm leading two notes now. <laughs> yes. So, uh, thank you for your attention. Any questions or comments on that? Just a quick comment, if I may, that I don't fit yeah. into any of those projects, but that I'm working on um, deep fake videos and um, increasingly also on um, yeah. AI generated text, i.e. kind of chat GPT type stuff. And, and that is precisely how you fit into the Volkswagen project. Yeah. So... Yeah, but no, you're right. You're not under an umbrella. You're you're uh, you're standing under your own uh, umbrella rather than anybody else's. Yeah. Any other uh, comments, questions? Uh, just a reminder before we run out of time that uh, next meetings will uh, be at one p.m. So all the remaining meetings will be back at one p.m. on Thursday. And I think the next meeting will be particularly aimed at third year students because we will go through the lab handbook. So it will be particularly useful for them. But if you want to join, of course, you're more than welcome. And that's next week, right? That you're doing yeah, it's next week, yes. Fantastic. Okay, very good. I guess you can stop recording, yes, Fabio. And um, yeah, if there are no other questions, then thank you for 